Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the service, I think you were all in here for that. Um, we're going to do a special service tonight, sort of a special prayer service um, to encourage one another to trust the Lord despite or um, uh, in spite of the outcome of the election. I mean, the election's a big deal. Make no mistake about it. It's going to determine uh, the future four years of this country, certainly with the presidential election, and then also uh, with the Senate and, and, and the uh, uh, House of Representatives, the Congress, and then all of the state assemblies and state Senate races and governor's races and so forth. Uh, it's a big deal. This election is huge, and um, uh, we need to continue to trust the Lord that regardless of the outcome, we're going to still be okay. We're, we're, you know, the earth is not going to um, you know, open up and swallow America if, if the election doesn't go the way that we want it to go. Uh, it will make it probably more difficult for Christians. Um, I, I personally voted for Donald Trump. I didn't say that ahead of time because I didn't want to get in trouble with the IRS or anybody saying I was endorsing. But I will say this. I did not vote for him in 2016 because I didn't trust him in 2016. He has earned my trust. And so I voted for him as a pastor, a Bible-believing pastor, knowing all of his background, all of his drama, all of the mess that he brought with him from kind of his past life of being a total narcissist and a billionaire playboy and all the rest. He has really uh, earned uh, my trust and earned my vote as the president um, it, because he has stood for the things that matter to me as a pastor and as a Christian, primarily religious freedom, the freedom uh, of speech for us to be able to speak freely and without censorship from the pulpits uh, in the churches in America, for him trying to uh, rebuild our economy so that we could have jobs and to help small businesses so they can provide for their families and we could have jobs uh, for our economy. Um, he has stood with Israel and has done more really for the nation of Israel than any other president in modern history in supporting Israel, moving our embassy uh, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, helping Israel to, to sign uh, peace deals with their neighbors, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, working on a peace deal with the Saudis. I mean, these are big, big, big accomplishments uh, that matter to me. Uh, he is the most pro-life president we've ever had, which is an amazing thing. His daughter, Ivanka Trump, publicly said she's a pro-life young woman. I think she's 39 years old. She's a billionaire. And she is saying she is pro-life. She's not pro-choice. And that's a big deal uh, to, to have somebody who came from the background that Trump did in money and Hollywood and all the rest uh, and, and to change his position, not just to say that he's changing his position from pro-abortion uh, or pro-choice to pro-life just to get a few votes, he actually put judges in all over the country. He appointed judges that are pro-life judges, three Supreme Court justices uh, who are, who are pro-life. And so for all of these reasons, yeah, I don't like a lot of the things he tweets. I don't think a lot of the, uh, I don't like a lot of the things he says, but Compared to uh, the contrast and compared to the idea of Joe Biden, who wants to allow children to transgender their, their gender at 8, 9, 10 years old, have the government pay for it, uh, and not tell the parents that the children are being transitioned from a boy to a girl just because a little boy says he wants to be a girl— uh, Joe Biden says he thinks that that should be okay. A child should be able to determine if he wants to change his sex at 8 years old, 9, 10 years old. I don't agree with that. I don't think that that's what we should be doing in America for our children. Uh, he's, uh, Biden is also a very pro-choice, pro-abortion, pro-death candidate. Uh, he was as a senator. He will be also uh, as a president. And that concerns me. He wants to shut the churches down all over the country uh, just like they're shut down still in California. Uh, it's illegal for churches, or at least it's uh, uh, not illegal, but it's against the executive order. It's in defiance of the executive order of the governor of California for us to even be meeting. And so if we had a president who shut the churches down, uh, then we could end up with a, uh, a major uh, First Amendment issue that comes up with a president trying to shut the churches down. To the contrary, President Trump said that the churches are essential and that they should be opened. And that's our president talking. So for these reasons, and again, I'm not saying this to influence anyone's vote. The vote is already done. It's over. But I'm just sharing with my, from my heart with you my perspective 
Uh, I do think this is a major election. I think the outcome of this election uh, is significant. President Trump has been trying to get us out of all of these endless wars that the industrial, military industrial complex has been fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq so that they can make hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars in money from the federal government to go to all of these defense contractors to go test out all of our drones and our weapons on foreign soil. Uh, but, but our men and women are fighting and dying uh, for, for, for oil and for other, other reasons. Uh, these countries have been killing each other for thousands of years in the Middle East. We don't need to be there in the center of these wars in Iraq and uh, Syria and Afghanistan and so forth. And so President Trump has been calling those troops home. He's been rescuing people that have been kidnapped by ISIS terrorists, rescuing pastors uh, from all over the world. So for all of these reasons... I'm praying that Donald Trump will be our president again for four more years. But we have to accept the fact that we're not in control of the future and the destiny of this country. And if God allows Joe Biden to become the president, then he's going to be our president. And to some degree, uh, you know, we, we, we get what we wanted because it's a democracy. And if people voted and the majority of uh, Americans want this sort of, uh, I would say, godless, really, government, um, then, then we need to do a better job of reaching uh, our, our, our brothers and sisters in the church and outside the church, Americans, uh, reaching them with our ideologies and our perspectives so that we can we could get more people to vote for the right candidates in the future. I don't think it's doom and gloom. I don't think it's all over. I mean, uh, the Republicans, uh, the conservative uh, Republicans kept control of the Senate, we believe, and that's a big deal because the Senate determines whether or not judges are elected or appointed to office. The president appoints, the uh, Senate has to vote to approve uh, the, the, the judges that are, that are nominated. And so we, we, we still, you know, we still have a hope, guys. We still have a hope. And I'm not sitting here and saying that I'm a Republican and this is a Republican platform. Uh, it's just the Republicans, their platform stands for what I believe in as a Christian man and as a pastor. Uh, pro-life against uh, abortion, Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, constitutional guarantee for freedom of religion. These are their platform where the National Democratic platform is pro-abortion, murdering babies all the way up to nine months, and even after nine months, if the uh, uh, abortion fails, they say that, in, like for example in New York, that they could kill the baby even after a baby is born at nine months that, that is viable, that could live. Uh, if the mother intended that baby to be aborted. So these are, these are brutal positions uh, that, that are major differences between the two parties and the two platforms. So we're not, you know, we're not loyal to a party, but to the platform of the party that we agree with, whether you call it Republican, Democrat, Independent. It just so happens the Republican platform is a much better platform from a pastor's standpoint than the Democratic platform. And again, I'm not saying this to influence any elections or to jeopardize our 501c3. The election's already over. But I do believe uh, that, uh, that we need to be aware. We need to be involved. We can't just bury our heads in the sand. We can't be fatalistic and say, que sera, sera, whatever's going to be is going to be. I don't have any vote, voice. I don't have any vote. I don't have any say. That's not true. In America, our founding fathers have given us a vote and given us a voice on how we are governed, even on uh, who we're going to elect, the people that are going to make the laws, and then appoint the judges that are going to interpret the laws and enforce the laws. Uh, so we have a voice uh, as Americans, and we need to use that voice. But in the end, we have to trust in the Lord regardless of the outcome of this election. I don't believe that if Donald Trump loses this election, that his followers should go out on the streets with AK-47s or AR-15s and start a civil war. I don't think that's, I won't support that. I won't support a civil war. Uh, even if the election doesn't go the way that we want. I know that there are a lot of people that are talking about that being a reality. And I don't think the church should have anything to do with that sort of talk about taking up arms against uh, fellow Americans just because we are unhappy with the results of the election. We can work on the next election and start to get more involved and, and get more of a voice and get more people uh, involved in another election. It's not the end of our uh, uh, 
constitutional republic here, our democracy, if we lose this one election from the standpoint of who we voted for and someone else getting uh, uh, put into office. So I've entitled this little devotional here tonight, and again, we're gonna, I'm just kind of sharing from my heart, and we're going to have some time at the end for, for us to pray together as a church body, to break up into groups and to pray together for our nation and for the election, because the election is not yet settled. There are still many votes being counted and uh, lawsuits being filed and so forth, so we're not going to probably know for a while as to what the results are, especially with the presidential uh, results. But we could still pray, and we could still knock uh, on the door of heaven and seek and knock and ask for God to intervene and to have mercy on our nation. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, and I've, I've entitled this devotional, Set Your Mind on Things Above. Set Your Mind on Things Above. Colossians 3 and verse 1 says, If then... You were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Verse 4, And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And so Paul the Apostle is exhorting the church there, the Colossian church, he's exhorting them to look up, to look up and think on and set your mind on and your eyes upon the things of heaven versus looking down and fixing your eyes upon the things of the earth. Are we um, concerned for heavenly things, or are we only concerned with earthly things and material things? Uh, are we those who are focused on the life that is after this life, or are we consumed with this life and this world as though this is all that there is, and there is no other life after this life? Uh, as Christians, we ought to be those who are focused on heaven and on the uh, eternal things, not the temporal and the temporary things. Now, look, we live in a temporal world. We live in a material, physical world, but this world is passing away, including our very bodies are passing away. They're going to die and go back to the dust someday. But the spirit that dwells within your body is eternal. Your spirit will live forever somewhere. Uh, And that is what we are supposed to be setting our focus on, is on the things of eternity, the things above, rather than the things below or the things that are mortal or, or temporal or temporary that are passing away especially as we are dealing with times of anxiety, we're dealing with times of uncertainty, Uh, this is the time that we are to look to God instead of looking to man. Look, I, I, you know, President Trump has won me over. I like the guy. I didn't like him when he first ran in 2016, and I did not vote for him. I wrote him Ben Carson's name, actually, uh, because I, I I didn't trust President Trump the first time. But he's earned my trust. And I would prefer that, that he is going to win. But it's not going to be the end of the world for me or my faith if he loses. I'm still going to trust that God is sovereign. I'm still going to believe that God has a plan for this nation. Uh, perhaps it's going to even uh, make the return of Jesus Christ sooner. His coming more imminent. If, if, if Christians are removed from the top levels of government of our country and replaced by godless socialists who are going to bring communism, communism always turns against the church wherever it goes, then that means that maybe Jesus is just going to come back sooner for his church, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, and so either way, regardless of what happens with this election, as critical as this election is, don't let the enemy weigh you down with anxiety and fear about the future. Because we're not, we're, we're not looking to man. We're not even looking to Donald Trump or any man. We're looking to God. We're looking for the men or women who are going to go and represent us as Christians. As we vote for people in a democratic society, we have a voice through who we vote for. And we want to vote for God-fearing people. People who are going to have morals and values like we do. Um, if the people who we voted for don't win, like is pretty much the case for all of us that voted in California, 
uh, for the most part, at least in this part of California. Uh, we don't ever win these elections. But um, the bottom line is, is that, you know, we don't, we don't just necessarily move away from California or give up on California. We still believe God has a plan for California, even if we aren't the political party that has the power in this state. You see, the church is still strong. We're still alive and well in California. I bet the rest of the country would be terrified to have a government like we have in Sacramento because it's the most socialistic government probably in the nation here uh, in Sacramento. And again, socialism leads to communism and eventually turns against the church and does not stand for the values that we stand for. But we're not going to throw in the towel. We're not going to give up our fight. We're certainly not going to stop uh, trusting in Jesus and believing in the Word of God. We're not putting our hope and faith in man. We're putting our hope and faith in God. There's only one man who I really trust, and that's the God-man, Jesus Christ. And he's not ruling and reigning yet. So we're going to have imperfect men and women because we're just imperfect people. There are no perfect men or women to vote for. There's no perfect human government. I think America has uh, about the best government that there is, but it's, it's certainly not a perfect government because it's run by men and women who are imperfect human beings. So again, we have to set our minds and our eyes on things above rather than the things below. Our, our key is to focus on eternal things, heavenly things rather than the material things. In John chapter 14, Jesus said this as he was about to go to get crucified on the cross of Calvary and be buried for three days and three nights. And he had just told his, his uh, disciples this in the upper room. Um, he said that he's uh, basically going to, he's going to be glorified. He's going to die. They knew that this is what he was talking about. They were concerned about him going to the cross. And then he says this in John 14, verse 1. Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. So Jesus is telling his disciples and uh, speaking to us. We are his disciples now. He was speaking to his disciples then, but this speaks to us now as his disciples. Uh, he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many mansions. So he's saying, don't worry about the things of this world. You know, all of, all of his disciples were going to go on and actually die for their faith. They were all going to be killed except for John. They tried to kill John. They threw John into a pot of boiling oil, and it didn't harm him. Kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three Hebrew boys, were thrown into the fiery furnace in Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, and they weren't burned. History tells us, church history, that they tried to, I think it was the emperor Domitian, tried to throw John the apostle, who was the last living apostle, who was handpicked by Jesus. All the other ones had been killed for their faith. Tried to throw him into a pot of boiling oil, and the oil did not harm him. He was unburned by this boiling oil. So because they couldn't kill him, they sent him to a rock island out there in the Mediterranean of the Aegean Sea, the Isle of Patmos, which was a mine, and it was kind of like a work camp island, and he was an old man living out there on this rocky crag, uh, the Isle of Patmos, um, where they thought he would probably die, and then God appeared to him and gave him the book of Revelation, the revelation of the future. John wrote it down, and then he got out of that uh, um, prison island of Patmos, and he went back to the churches and uh, wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in the book of Revelation, and probably wrote the Gospel of John at that time as well. So he lived to be a, a, an old man. He lived out his days. But all of the other ones, all of, all of the other disciples who were handpicked by Jesus, they were all killed. They were martyred, killed for their faith. Some of them were crucified. Some of them were beheaded, like Paul the Apostle was beheaded. Uh, some of them were, uh, you know, they, they were killed in different ways, stoned to death and so forth. Some of them were speared to death as they were going and preaching the gospel. And, and it's because they understood that this life is not all that there is, that they were willing. They didn't feel like they were throwing their life away by going and preaching Christ, even though they knew that it could cost them their life, and it did cost them their life because they were focused on the life that is to come, eternal life, 
heaven. The house that Jesus says, I'm going to go and prepare uh, for you. The mansion that I'm going to prepare for you, my father's house. And I'm going to come and I'm going to bring you with me. Uh, if I go and I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also. They were uh, mature enough to get to the point where they said, it doesn't really matter what happens to me. I just want to be faithful in serving my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with the life that I have, with the skills that I have, with the gifts and talents that I have, with the limited time that I have, because this life really doesn't matter. What matters is the life that is to come. In Hebrews, in chapter 12, the author to the Hebrews says this about how we are supposed to live our lives now as God's people. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So again, the focus and the example is Jesus. Jesus is the example that we look to. He is our role model. Every other role model will fail us, but Jesus is our perfect role model, and he's the one that we should want to be like, and we should want to imitate and emulate. And we're told here that we're to lay aside all of the weight and the sins and the things of this world that ensnare us. I would even say being sucked into the political system can become a snare to us because we begin to put our hope in men and we take our eyes off of the Lord and we're no longer hoping in God. And that's a problem. Our hope is not in man. Our hope is not in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or the Independent Party or any other party. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And our responsibility is to vote for people who are going to further the kingdom of God here in this country. That's, that's how we should be voting. But in the end, even if our candidates are not elected, our party's not elected, uh, we still will believe God rather than man. We will trust in God and obey God rather than man. And we will look to Jesus. This is the key. Looking up to Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him, Jesus, he endured the cross. He despised the shame as he was hanging there likely naked, being crucified. They would uh, strip him of all their clothes. So the shame of being hanging there with the nails in his hand and his feet, you know, naked in front of all the people. What shame. He's God. He's the one that created everything. He's the perfect man who never sinned. He took our sins upon himself. But because he was looking through the cross, he endured the cross despising the shame because he was looking for the joy that was set before him. On the other side of the cross was going to be joy, was going to be victory, was going to be salvation for all those who would trust in his finished work upon the cross and that he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, he said it is finished. He finished the work that he came here to do, which was to provide a way for mankind to have their sins forgiven, to be saved, uh, and, and to be able to uh, be adopted into the family of God instead of just being uh, those who are uh, going to live in this world apart from God and then spend eternity apart from God, which would have been our lot if Jesus did not come down to this earth to save uh, a wretch like me and a wretch like you. He says, For consider him, verse 3, who endured such hostilities from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Think about all that Jesus suffered. And he was faithful to finish the work that he came to do. And he suffered greatly. Jesus suffered more than anyone of us will ever suffer. And yet, uh, he endured. He persevered. Uh, he went all the way through the pain and the shame and the cross in order to get to the joy that was set before him so that he could be uh, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
And so, uh, look, we're his body. We're the body of Christ. And so if Jesus suffered victoriously, then we can suffer victoriously too because we're his body. We make up his body. He's the head. We're the body. We're the members of the body of Christ. He's in us, and we are in him spiritually. And so because Jesus endured to the end, we also can endure to the end. And we should not grow weary uh, and discouraged in our souls because Jesus was and is victorious. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, we read this about Jesus. We read, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember those who have the rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so because he's with us forever, he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, then we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's God. He's the creator of all things. He conquered death. He conquered Satan, conquered sin, conquered hell. And he's victorious and he's seated at the right hand of the Father ever to make intercession for you and for me. So because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and Jesus tells us, I will never leave you nor forsake you, then we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We put our eyes on things above, and we take our eyes off of men and, uh, and the things that are below. In Romans chapter 12, Paul the Apostle tells us this about how we are to live as his people in this world. He says, I beseech you, verse 1 of Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so, again, we see that we are called to be living sacrifices, that we are to be those who willingly climb up on the altar and allow the Lord to slay us if that's what he chooses to do with our lives, to be living sacrifices. We're no longer to be living for ourselves or for the things of this world anymore. We were bought with a price. He purchased us with the precious blood of Christ. We belong to him. And so it is only reasonable that we would present our bodies to God as a living, holy, acceptable sacrifice and that we're not being conformed to this world, but we are being transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we may prove what that, uh, what is that good, acceptable, perfect will of God. You're here tonight or you're watching online because you want this for yourself. You want to be a living sacrifice. You don't want to be conformed to this world. You want to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so that is a holy desire that God has placed within you and he will fulfill that desire and he will allow you to be victorious uh, and transformed by the renewing of your mind through time in his word and time with him here tonight. Again, it's no longer my life. It's his life. My life is hid in Christ with God. My, my life is with God in Christ. I'm with him and he's with me. I don't belong to myself anymore. I've been bought with a price. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul the Apostle says this, he says, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul says, 
I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Remember Jesus said, if anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross, and let him follow me. This is what Paul is saying. That's what he's done. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. When they killed Jesus, they killed me. Uh, and, and he lives in me. And the life uh, which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. He lives in me and he lives his life through me. It's not my life anymore. I've surrendered my life to Christ, he's saying. It's not about what I want. It's about thy will be done. Not my will, but thy, bil- thy will be done. Even as Jesus taught us uh, to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 7, he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you if his son asks for bread? will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And so Jesus tells us that we are to come to God asking, seeking, knocking. And that means that you continue asking. It means ask and continue asking. Seek and continue seeking. Knock and continue knocking until God gives you the answer. And that is the privilege that we have as God's people. We have access to the throne of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. We have access to the throne room of God to come and petition God and to bring our concerns and our requests before him. We are his people. And so we are going to do that tonight. We're going to gather together in groups and we are going to pray and we are going to ask and we are going to seek and we are going to knock. And then we're going to trust that the Lord is going to answer the prayers in his way, in his timing. But we are going to obey what Jesus told us to do. Ask and seek and knock. As a matter of fact, James tells us in James chapter 5 in verse 16 about prayer. James says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective or effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. It did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and earth produced its fruit. Now what uh, James is telling us here is he's saying, look, Elijah was this powerful man of God. He performed all these miracles in the Bible. If you read the story of Elijah and then Elisha, a powerful, powerful prophet of God called fire down from heaven to destroy the prophets of Baal and uh, to, uh, uh, you know, come and, and, and uh, consume the sacrifice that he had made and uh, raising uh, people from the dead. I mean, Elijah did a lot of incredible things in his life. And, and yet we're told he was just a guy like you and me. He was just one of us. He was a man like us with a nature like ours. And yet he prayed earnestly it would not rain. It did not rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed and, and, and the Lord gave the rain. Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. He prayed, he prayed effectively. Effective prayer means you're praying according to the word of God. If you're praying against the word of God, you're not praying effectively because God, uh, you don't want God to answer a prayer if it's in contrast to what his word says. You only want God to answer your prayer if it's what his will is for you and his word tells you what his will is for you. So to pray effectively, we must pray biblically. And Elijah was just a guy just like us, but he brought a drought on the land of Israel because he was praying according to the word of God. God said, if they go after other gods, Pray to me and I'll bring drought on the land as a punishment to my people Israel for going after other gods. So Elijah was following the word of God in his prayer that it would not rain as a judgment against Israel because they, King Ahab and Jezebel and so forth, they were going after other gods. 
Uh, and then he prayed again three and a half years later. And then the drought broke and the famine broke. And then God sent the rain. Um, and, and again, he prayed fervently. He prayed effectively according to the word of God. And then he prayed fervently. He prayed seven times. He kept praying and praying and praying until the cloud came and the storm came. He didn't just pray once and say, well, God didn't answer my prayer. So I guess he doesn't want to bring rain. I guess he wants to continue this drought and this famine. No, he knew it was time. God had shown him it was time for the famine to break, for the rain to come. And so he prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And it's literally like he birthed the answer to the prayer. He didn't give up. He labored in prayer until the answer came. And so this is an encouragement to you and I that we can pray in this way as well. Effectively praying according to the, the word of God and the will of God, and then fervently where we just don't stop. We keep seeking, we keep knocking, and we keep asking until the Lord answers our prayer. We're told that as we put our eyes on the Lord, that we have his peace. Wonderful promise in Isaiah chapter uh, 26 and verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. Because he trusts in you. What a wonderful, beautiful promise this is. He will keep him in perfect, perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Uh, to where if you keep your mind and your focus on Jesus, on God, you will have the peace of God that surpasses understanding. You won't be all wrecked by whatever the media is saying. Or what the polls are saying. Or what the news reports are saying. Or what anybody is saying. Because you're trusting in the Lord. Your mind is focused on him. You're trusting that he loves you and he has a plan for you. And he has a plan for your family. He has a plan for our country. This is not the end of the world, regardless of whatever the result is of this one election. He will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. In the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 3, wonderful promise uh, in the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. So we have to trust in the Lord and not lean on our own understanding. Man looks to man. We're not called to look to man for understanding. We're called to look above man to look to heaven, to look to God, to look to his word. And then we're to trust in him. We acknowledge him in all our ways and then he promises he will direct our paths. In Jeremiah chapter 29, God gave this uh, promise to the Jews when they were in Babylon. In Jeremiah 29 and verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Remember, they were carried away captive as a punishment because they were Id idolatrous. They were worshiping other idols. As a matter of fact, the uh, archaeologists have found a tremendous number of idols of uh, Ashtoreth and ba Baal and Molech from the time of the Babylonian captivity uh, in, the, in the burned uh, remnants of the archaeological sites of Jerusalem, Judah, and uh, that time period, the 6th century, 7th century B.C., they found all kinds of, of little idols and gods that were in the homes of the people there in Jerusalem. So God punished them. That was God's judgment or his discipline upon his people by taking them out of the promised land, sending them into captivity for 70 years into Babylon. But it was still part of God's plan for them. He says, after he's done this, caused you all to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon, he tells them, build houses, dwell in them, Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters. So that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. And this is kind of the charge to God's people from that point forward in this fallen world of Babylon, in, in the world which we live. It's a fallen world. It's a corrupt world. It's a godless world. It's an idolatrous world that we live in, all of us, whether we live in the United States or we live somewhere else. It's a corrupt, fallen world run by corrupt, fallen men and women. And so God is saying, you know, uh, 
do good. Live and, 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 and you know, don't just long for being back uh, in, in Jerusalem. Build houses, plant gardens, get married, have families. It's going to be 70 years and then you're going to go back. But, you know, don't just sit here and feel sorry for yourselves in Babylon. I carried you away captive here. I want you to prosper here. He says, seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. This is Babylon, which was the seat of all ancient idolatry and paganism in the ancient world. And yet God is saying, you will even find me in Babylon if you seek me. You'll find me when you have sought for me with all of your heart, he's going to say here in a minute. And he says that as there's peace in the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive, pray to the Lord for that city, for in its peace you will have peace. So regardless of the outcome of this election, we have to pray for this, for whoever our leaders are. God raises up kings. Promotion comes not from the east or from the west, but from the Lord, our God, the scriptures say. He takes one king off the throne. He puts another king on the throne. Ultimately, we have to trust in the sovereignty of God. Even though God gives free will to men, and a lot of times man uses their free will uh, to do things that are not pleasing in God's sight. Ultimately, God is still sovereign. In Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. In other words, he's saying look to the future. Don't just get bogged down in the present circumstances that you find yourself in because I have a plan for you, and it's not to leave you in Babylon forever. You're going to go back to your land, to the promised land. The key is to to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. The key is to keep our eyes fixed on the Lord. The key is for us to search for God and to seek for him with all of our heart. And God says, if you search for me, you will be found by me. You will find me. He says, you pray to me and I will listen to you. We can't control elections. We can't control court cases and Vote counting and all of these things. There's a lot of things that are out of our hands, out of our control. But we can pray. We could stand upon the promises of God. We could trust in the Lord regardless of the outcome that God is still sovereign over his creation and that he still has a plan for us and he still has a plan for America. Look, there was 70 million people that voted for President Trump and 72 or 73 million voted for Joe Biden. That's a lot of people and our country is divided right down the middle. Either way, that's a tremendous number of people who are going to lose this election. And so we have to understand that. Um, In the end, we trust the Lord for the outcome. A couple more scriptures here. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 27 to 31. Beautiful promise of God here for his people. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. If you're weary tonight, trust in the Lord. Turn to the Lord. Run to the Lord. Stand upon the promises that he gives us in his word. We have his precious promises given to us because we are his people. Isaiah 54, 17 tells us this. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Regardless of what comes our way, even from the fires of hell, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. 
according to the word of God. And then in Isaiah 55, verses 6 through 9, we read this. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You notice a common theme, Old and New Testament. God calls us to himself. He calls us to seek himself. And when we seek him, we will find him. When we cry out to him, he will defend us. He will deliver us from our enemies, even if it's against all odds, even if there is no human understanding, he will give us the peace that surpasses understanding. It's a supernatural thing. And that's how the church has remained the church throughout 2,000 years of persecution and troubles and corruption. And yet the church is still alive and well on, on planet earth because Jesus promised, I will build my gates, uh, I will build my church rather, and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. So we have the promises of God to stand upon. We are his people. Maybe we're the generation that sees his return. Wouldn't that be exciting if we were the generation that was raptured? But we all know things are going to get really, really, really bad for the planet before that happens, or at least leading up to that time. Uh, and, and, and then, you know, maybe we'll be that generation that sees Christ fulfill all of these promises and prophecies that were written about thousands of years ago. Uh, if that's the case, praise the Lord. But things are going to get harder, not easier. You know, uh, they're going to say peace and safety and then come sudden destruction, the scriptures say, about that time. And so our hope is not in man. Our hope is in the Lord. His ways are so much higher than our ways. His thoughts are so much higher than our thoughts. And we could trust God that he will fulfill the promises in his word. I'm going to call up the worship team. They're going to close us with a song. And then, um, and then I'm going to pray. They're going to sing a song here. And then we're going to break up into groups of three or four. You can either sit with the people you came with or just grab some people around you. There's not a ton of people here tonight. And uh, we'll just spend, you know, five or ten or fifteen minutes individually in groups of three or four praying. And then after that, you're welcome to be dismissed uh, and go over to the cafe if you're interested in hanging out for uh, dessert and coffee. I'm so glad you all came tonight. I was so burdened. I didn't sleep much last night and so just heavily burdened all day today about what's going on in our country. Um, but I think that this is, this is what we need to focus on. We need to encourage one another in the Lord. We need to remember God is still on the throne and that in the end, we win, regardless of what happens. In the end, we win because Jesus Christ is victorious. Father, thank you for your people, Lord. Thank you for our time in your house, Father. Thank you, Lord, that we could run to you when our world is falling apart. And, Lord, that you never change. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, Father, that you have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. And we have the promise in your word that if we seek you, we will find you when we have sought for you with all of our heart. Bless your people here tonight, Father. Strengthen your church. Strengthen your body, Lord. Strengthen your people. And Lord, we do pray for the results of this election. We ask you to have mercy upon our leaders. You'd have mercy upon President Trump and Vice President Mike Pence, Lord. Uh, you'd have mercy, Father God, on all of these uh, Senate, Senate races and senators that are still counting votes. Lord, you'd have mercy on the leadership of our land, Father God. We pray that you would do a great work here. We pray for a wonderful uh, revival of your church in America in these last days. We ask for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon your people, Lord. We look forward to the future because we know, Lord, that our future is in your hands. Bless us, Lord. Be with us, Father. Encourage us tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.